Hello, my viewers, and welcome back to my retro attic. I'm going to be honest with you, it just feels so great to be back here, to be together with all my retro stuff. All the PCs, the laptops, the monitors, the keyboards, just everything. And what you are looking at here is what I call the Floppy Backer 3000, which are two 486 motherboards set up explicitly to back up the thousands and thousands of floppy disks that I somehow accumulated over the years. But we're going to cover them in a later time, because the star of today's show is this. A mysterious ISA card that I bought from eBay a few weeks ago and thanks to a comment from a very knowledgeable viewer from my last video on this card, it has been confirmed to be a clone of the Hercules graphics card. Today our mission is simple, we're going to try to turn it on, see if it works, if it doesn't, try to fix it. If it does work, then we'll try to explore the card by running some games and software on it and see if we can learn some interesting things about the Hercules graphics card. So without further ado, let's get right to the smoke test. Sounds fine. But I forgot to turn the screen on. So here we go. Good sign. Yep. Our BIOS is prompting us to set up the display. Save changes and exit. Okay. It's good signs. I don't know what are the error messages there. It can be conflicts in the LPT port or like the printer port because I've got like a serial parallel card, like a multifunction card behind the Hercules graphics card, but the Hercules graphics card also has a printer port. That may cause a conflict. I've changed the refresh rate to 50 Hz to match the graphics output of the Hercules card and turn off the light so that the screen just shows up clearer on camera. This screen does not use long persistence phosphor unlike the IBM 5151. However, due to its monochrome nature, it still looks much better and clearer than CGA or early VGA displays. First things first. Let's try image disk. Uh, I don't know. I haven't run image disk on a Hercules before. But it does work. And it's got stuff and I can clean head. Uh, one. Yeah, image this actually works. Let's try Planet X3. And now I can select Hercules. I don't have any sound card present, so I'm going to say PC speaker. And it just works. I mean, it works beautifully. And the rendering is fast. I was expecting it to be bottlenecked by the 8-bit ISA bus, but it's not. Okay, I... Oh, 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 I'm... I'm... I'm in the base. Uh, bull, B is for bulldoze. That's for build. Z is for bulldoze. P is for pickup. Hey, 
we got a crystal. Of course, we can turn on. Turn on the music. It works fine. And that, my viewers, is Planet X3 on her Hercules card. To be honest, I'm expecting it to have a bit more problem. Maybe a glitch here, a dead pixel there, maybe something wrong with the RAM. But no, it, this card just works and it works beautifully. I mean, isn't it always nice to see some British quality? That brings us to the manufacturer of this card. The Mysterious Spoons Limited and the Compro 88. Another comment in my last video suggests that Compro was likely to be an abbreviation of the name Computo Pro or Computo Processing Limited, a UK based PC clone manufacturer that operated back in the 1980s. Following this lead, I found this full page advertisement on the November issue of Practical Computing. It advertised the Compro 88 as the PC with everything except a four figure price tag. It was apparently one of the lowest price offerings on the UK market at its time. A month later, they ran the same ad, this time with the price tag proudly announced on the PC screen. And in the February 96 issue, they ran a somewhat tamer half page ad advertising the Compro 88 for its 24 hour nationwide response and on site maintenance, 640K of onboard memory, hard drive, and tape backup options, and quote, superb engineering built by us in Britain. In the same issue, Computer Pro was listed alongside Centaur, Walters, and Tandem as the company that will bring quote unquote the beginning of the end of PC pricing as we knew it. Or as the subtitle of the issue more boldly claims, the end of the IBM PC. Ironically, IBM sued Computer Pro and Computer Pro went out of business in 1993. But in a more figurative sense, it was clone manufacturers like Computer Pro that finally rendered the PC business for IBM unprofitable and eventually forced it to be sold off. So the claim does hold some truth to it. But that's enough history lessons. What about the technical aspects of this card? Well, before we begin, I'm going to first address the elephant in the room or the lack thereof. If you go to Wikipedia and search for the Hercules graphics card, you'll see that it has two big DIP40 chips. And one of them is the Motorola 6845 CRT controller that's there to maintain compatibility with the original MDA card and because it's probably just the best option. And the other chip is something called the Video 100. It is there to replace several of the 74 series TTL logic gates, presumably to reduce production cost. Later models will also have a DIP40 chip closer to the printer port that's used to control, well, the printer port. And that presumably further lowers the price of the card. This card, however, has neither of them because Spoons Limited, they were not Hercules. So they did not have access to those Video 100 chips. What is interesting to me is that this card in 1988 should retail for a higher price or has a lower margin than the official Hercules card. And although as a commenter in my last video has pointed out that many monochrome or even original MDA options were still available for older PCs back in 1988, I still don't see why people would choose this card over an official Hercules that should cost less. I think the main selling point of this card is maybe the better build quality. I mean, after all, it's working after 
35 years, 36 years actually. Or Hercules just weren't selling graphics card in the UK back then. Um, maybe, I haven't checked but I don't find it very likely. <laughs> The 64K of VRAM on this board enables this card to display a rather unusual 720 by 348 by 1 bit per pixel graphics screen, which are useful for things like CAD applications and displaying foreign languages and probably desktop publishing. What is a bit interesting is that if you do the math, the Hercules standard supports a text resolution of 80 by 25 and each text character is 9 pixels by 14 pixels big. So if you run the numbers, you will get a text resolution of 720 by 350, which is exactly two lines taller than the graphics resolution. And the difference is not due to a lack of VRAM. In fact, this 64K VRAM supports not one, but two pages of 720 by 348 graphics. And both can be accessed by the CPU at the same time. Therefore, this card supports double buffering. And even half of the VRAM has enough space for 720 by 364 monochrome display. Therefore, I'm not quite sure what is at play here. Maybe it has something to do with addressing. Maybe it saves some chips here or there to just ignore two of the lines, but I'm not sure. Also, I want to make a correction to my last video. I correctly identified that this is an SRAM chip and said it is used to display redefinable fonts. However, it is not. There is a version of the Hercules card that has redefinable custom font, but this card is apparently not a clone of that. This SRAM is called an attribute cache or a character cache. It basically holds a copy of every other byte in the VRAM so that when the CPU is trying to write to the VRAM, it actually writes to both the RAM chips here and the cache chip here. However, when the CRT controller tries to read the RAM, and display information, characters, on the screen is actually reading from both the main VRAM and the cache at the same time. Thus, making this card a half 16-bit graphics card because the data bus is 8-bit when you are writing to it and 16-bit when you are reading from it. And some may ask why do you employ such a weird scheme to access your VRAM? And the answer is something we all know and love, the CGA snow effect. Well, apparently this is not a CGA card, but the principles are the same. If the CPU is accessing the VRAM and the CRD controller is reading the contents of VRAM, what is written to the VRAM will be read back to the CRT controller instead. So if the CPU is not writing to the exact byte that the CRT controller is reading, wrong information will be fetched from the bus and sent to the screen, causing graphical glitches that looks like snow. And by fetching the character or attribute information from the cache chip, the load on the VRAM data bus is reduced. So the CPU have enough time to access the VRAM while the CRT controller is trying to display something on the screen. Quite a clever solution if you ask me. However, there is a catch. This attribute cache is only 2048 bytes in size. And that is chosen specifically to display an 80 by 25 text screen. Meanwhile, the actual video RAM 
is 64 kilobytes in size, meaning that the VRAM has 32 pages of AD by 25 text. This sounds great until you realize that because this card employs the cache scheme, only one of those 32 pages of text can be used. And finally, we have the character ROM. I think this has been backed up and archived somewhere, but a lot of people requested me to dump this ROM and upload it to the internet, so I will do it. That is about it for this Hercules clone graphics card. However, there are two things that I want to mention that are not specific to this card, nor is it specific to the Hercules graphics standard. It is actually something that's just an interesting trivia to the IBM MDA standard. There are evidence that IBM wanted to make the MDA a color text only card and in fact, people claim that it is in the original technical documentation and there are traces in the sketchmatic that's labeled red, green, and blue. And indeed, people had enabled color output on the MDA card. You can call that a secret feature. However, to use that, one needs a very specific type of monitor because the card will still output in the MDA refresh rate and the scan line frequency and everything, but it will output in a CGA like RGBI format. Thus, it is incompatible with any standardized displays on the market. However, people apparently did it, and I heard the way to do it is to use something called a multi sync monitor, which is a bit rare and I currently don't have it. That is the color feature of the MDA card. Another thing, another interesting feature of the MDA slash Hercules card is that it supports kind of a dual headed setup under DOS. And this is accomplished by the card using a different set of VRAM addresses and IO ports than normal CGA or VGA. There are a lot of videos on YouTube demonstrating this with DOS, with like the mod mode mono command, or with like professional software that use this to do graph plotting for spreadsheets, for example. But those are not what I want to demonstrate today. What I want to demonstrate is games that would use this feature to enhance the experience of the player. I did track down a game called Mac Warrior 2 that's supposed to use the secondary screen not as a part of gameplay but as an output for the debugger. But that game requires a Pentium or up to run. And although I have Pentium and Pentium 2 systems, they lack the 8-bit I support that's required to run this card. So I set up for the next best thing and downloaded Mac Warrior 1. That game was released in 1989 and it's probably targeting 286 or 386 system. And it does run smoothly on this 486SX. However, there was nothing displayed on the monochrome screen during my time playing this game. So I guess maybe monochrome cards were still a thing in 1988, 1989 as shown by this card. So the developers tried to hide this feature from the player to prevent the player from cheating. Or maybe I just don't know the secret key combo that enables the debugger. But that's it for this video. Huge thanks go out to my patrons, and I will see you in the next one. Bye! Hey, wait a moment. Huh? Oh no.